Lesson 6 Motivation and Preparation for Mission Sabbath Afternoon November 4 Jesus would have those who are engaged in his service not eager for rewards nor feel that they must receive compensation for all that they do. The Lord would have our minds run in a different channel, for he sees not as man sees. He does not judge by appearances, but estimates a man by the sincerity of his heart. Paul kept in view the crown of life to be given him, and not only to be given to him, but to all who love his appearing. It was the victory gained through faith in Jesus Christ that made the crown so desirable. He ever exalted Jesus. All boasting of talent, of victory in ourselves, is out of place. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Councils on Stewardship, page 339. The Lord desires us to rest in Him without a question as to our measure of reward. When Christ abides in the soul, the thought of reward is not uppermost. This is not the motive that actuates our service. It is true that in a subordinate sense we should have respect to the recompense of reward. God desires us to appreciate His promised blessings, but He would not have us eager for rewards nor feel that for every duty we must receive compensation. We should not be so anxious to gain the reward as to do what is right, irrespective of all gain. Love to God and to our fellow men should be our motive. Christ's Object Lessons Page 398. Willing service and joyous self-denial is the only spirit that should actuate the followers of Jesus. Our Divine Master has given an example of how His disciples are to work. To those whom He bade, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men, Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, He offered no stated sum as a reward for their services. They were to share with Him in self-denial and sacrifice. Not for the wages we receive are we to labor. The motive that prompts us to work for God should have in it nothing akin to self-serving. Unselfish devotion and a spirit of sacrifice have always been and always will be the first requisite of acceptable service. Our Lord and Master designs that not one thread of selfishness shall be woven into His work. Into our efforts we are to bring the tact and skill, the exactitude and wisdom that the God of perfection required of the builders of the earthly tabernacle. Yet in all our labors we are to remember that the greatest talents or the most splendid services are acceptable only when self is laid upon the altar a living, consuming sacrifice. Prophets and Kings, pages 64 and 65. Sunday, November 5. To share the good news. Christ's first work on earth after his resurrection was to convince his disciples of his undiminished love and tender regard for them, to give them proof that he was their living Savior, that he had broken the fetters of the tomb and could no longer be held by the enemy death to reveal that he had the same heart of love as when he was with them, as their beloved teacher, he appeared to them again and again. He would draw the bonds of love still closer around them. Go tell my brethren, he said, that they meet me in Galilee. As they heard this appointment, so definitely given, the disciples began to think of Christ's words to them foretelling his resurrection. But even now, they did not rejoice. They could not cast off their doubt and perplexity. Even when the women declared that they had seen the Lord, the disciples would not believe. They thought them under an illusion. The Desire of Ages, pages 793 and 794. How many are still doing what these disciples did? 
How many echo Mary's despairing cry? They have taken away the Lord, and we know not where they have laid him. To how many might the Savior's words be spoken? Why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? He is close beside them, but their tear-blinded eyes do not discern him. He speaks to them, but they do not understand. Oh, that the bowed head might be lifted, that the eyes might be opened to behold him, that the ears might listen to his voice. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen. Bid them look not to Joseph's new tomb that was closed with a great stone and sealed with the Roman seal. Christ is not there. Look not to the empty sepulcher. Mourn not as those who are hopeless and helpless. Jesus lives, and because he lives, we shall live also. From grateful hearts, from lips touched with holy fire, let the glad song ring out. Christ is risen. He lives to make intercession for us. Grasp this hope, and it will hold the soul like a sure, tried anchor. Believe, and thou shalt see the glory of God. The Desire of Ages, page 794. We should cultivate kindliness and courtesy in our association with those whom we meet. Let us strive always to present the truth in an easy way. This truth means life, eternal life to the receiver. Study, therefore, to pass easily and courteously from subjects of a temporal nature to the spiritual and eternal. While walking by the way or seated by the wayside, you may drop into some heart the seed of truth. There is work to be done for our Master. There are souls who may by our influence be led to Christ. Who is ready to engage in this work with all the heart? Our High Calling, page 301. Monday, November 6. A Prophetic Foundation Jesus remained with his disciples forty days, causing them joy and gladness of heart as he opened to them more fully the realities of the kingdom of God. He commissioned them to bear testimony to the things which they had seen and heard concerning his sufferings, death, and resurrection, that he had made a sacrifice for sin, and that all who would might come unto him and find life. With faithful tenderness, he told them that they would be persecuted and distressed, but they would find relief in recalling their experience and remembering the words which he had spoken to them. He told them that he had overcome the temptations of Satan and obtained the victory through trials and suffering. Satan could have no more power over him, but would bring his temptations to bear more directly upon them and upon all who should believe in his name but they could overcome as he had overcome. Jesus endowed his disciples with power to work miracles and told them that although they should be persecuted by wicked men, he would from time to time send his angels to deliver them. Their lives could not be taken until their mission should be accomplished. Then they might be required to seal with their blood the testimonies which they had borne. Early Writings, page 189. Those who have Jesus abiding in the heart by faith have actually received the Holy Spirit. Every individual who receives Jesus as his personal Savior just as surely receives the Holy Spirit to be his counselor, sanctifier, guide, and witness. The more closely the believer walks with God, the clearer his witness, and, as a sure result, the more powerful will be the influence of his testimony upon others of a Savior's love. The more he will give evidence that he prizes the Word of God. It is his meat, it is his drink, to satisfy the thirsty soul. He prizes the privilege of learning the will of God from his word. The Upward Look, page 19. Belief in Christ is essential to spiritual life. Those who feast on the word never hunger, never thirst, never desire any higher or more exalted good. The truest, the most exalted knowledge is found in the word of God, in its simplicity, there is eloquence. The Bible is our guide in the safe paths that lead to eternal life. God has inspired men to write that which will present the truth to us, which will attract, and which, if practiced, will enable the receiver to obtain moral power to rank among the most highly educated minds. The minds of all who make the word of God their study will enlarge. 
far more than any other study, this is of a nature to increase the powers of comprehension and endow every faculty with new vigor. It brings us into close connection with all heaven, imparting wisdom and knowledge and understanding. The gospel is adapted for spiritual food to satisfy man's spiritual appetite. In every case, it is just what man needs. Sons and Daughters of God, page 70. Tuesday, November 7. Waiting and Mission. Christ's anxious followers gladly listened to his teachings, eagerly feasting upon every word which fell from his holy lips. Now they certainly knew that he was the Savior of the world. His words sank deep into their hearts, and they sorrowed that they must soon be parted from their heavenly teacher and no longer hear comforting, gracious words from his lips. But again their hearts were warmed with love and exceeding joy as Jesus told them that he would go and prepare mansions for them and come again and receive them, that they might be ever with him. He promised also to send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to guide them into all truth and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Early Writings, page 190. We must have time set apart for meditation and prayer and for receiving spiritual refreshing. We do not value the power and efficacy of prayer as we should. Prayer and faith will do what no power on earth can accomplish. The temptations to which we are daily exposed make prayer a necessity. Dangers beset every path. Those who are seeking to rescue others from vice and ruin are especially exposed to temptation. In constant contact with evil, they need a strong hold upon God, lest they themselves be corrupted. When we permit our communion with God to be broken, our defense is departed from us. Not all your good purposes and good intentions will enable you to withstand evil. You must be men and women of prayer. Your petitions must not be faint, occasional, and fitful, but earnest, persevering, and constant. It is not always necessary to bow upon your knees in order to pray. Cultivate the habit of talking with the Savior when you are alone, when you are walking, and when you are busy with your daily labor. Let the heart be continually uplifted in silent petition for help, for light, for strength, for knowledge. Let every breath be a prayer. The Ministry of Healing, pages 509 and 510. Those who are of the household of faith should never neglect the assembling of themselves together, for this is God's appointed means of leading his children into unity in order that in Christian love and fellowship they may help, strengthen, and encourage one another. As brethren of our Lord, we are called with a holy calling to a holy, happy life. Having entered the narrow path of obedience, let us refresh our minds by communion with one another and with God. As we see the day of God approaching, let us meet often to study His Word and to exhort one another to be faithful unto the end. These earthly assemblies are God's appointed means by which we have opportunity to speak with one another and to gather all the help possible to prepare in the right way to receive in the heavenly assemblies the fulfillment of the pledges of our inheritance. Our High Calling, page 166. Wednesday, November 8. Whom you crucified. On the day of Pentecost, the Infinite One revealed Himself in power to the Church. By His Holy Spirit, He descended from the heights of heaven as a rushing mighty wind to the room in which the disciples were assembled. Words of penitence and confession of sin were mingled with songs of praise for sins forgiven. Words of thanksgiving and of prophecy were heard. All heaven was bending low to behold and adore the wisdom of matchless, incomprehensible love. The apostles and disciples were lost in wonder and exclaimed, Herein is love! They grasped the imparted gift. Their hearts were surcharged with a benevolence so full, so deep, so far-reaching, that it impelled them to go to the ends of the earth testifying, 
God forbid that we should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. They were filled with an intense longing to add to the church such as should be saved. That I may know him, page 344. Three thousand souls were added to the church. The apostles spoke by the power of the Holy Ghost, and their words could not be controverted, for they were confirmed by mighty miracles wrought by them through the outpouring of the Spirit of God. The disciples were themselves astonished at the results of this visitation and the quick and abundant harvest of souls. All the people were filled with amazement. The arguments of the apostles alone, although clear and convincing, would not have removed the prejudice of the Jews which had withstood so much evidence. But the Holy Ghost sent those arguments home with divine power to their hearts. They were as sharp arrows of the Almighty, convicting them of their terrible guilt in rejecting and crucifying the Lord of glory. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Story of Redemption, page 245. Peculiar and rapid changes will soon take place, and God's people are to be endowed with the Holy Spirit so that with heavenly wisdom they may meet the emergencies of this age and as far as possible counteract the demoralizing movements of the world. If the church is not asleep, if the followers of Christ watch and pray, they may have light to comprehend and appreciate the movements of the enemy. The end is near. God calls upon the church to set in order the things that remain. Workers together with God, you are empowered by the Lord to take others with you into the kingdom. You are to be God's living agents, channels of light to the world, and round about you are angels of heaven with their commission from Christ to sustain, strengthen, and uphold you in working for the salvation of souls. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 436. Thursday, November 9. A PICTURE OF THE EARLY CHURCH After the descent of the Holy Spirit, the disciples went forth to proclaim a risen Savior, their one desire, the salvation of souls. They rejoiced in the sweetness of the communion with saints. They were tender, thoughtful, self-denying, willing to make any sacrifice for the truth's sake. In their daily association with one another, they revealed the love that Christ had commanded them to reveal. By unselfish words and deeds, they strove to kindle this love in other hearts. The believers were ever to cherish the love that filled the hearts of the apostles after the descent of the Holy Spirit. They were to go forward in willing obedience to the new commandment, As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. John chapter 13 verse 34 so closely were they to be united to Christ that they would be enabled to fulfill his requirements. The power of a Savior who could justify them by his righteousness was to be magnified. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8, page 241. The Apostle Paul exhorts his brethren to manifest in their lives the power of the truth which he had presented to them. By meekness and gentleness, forbearance and love, they were to exemplify the character of Christ and the blessings of his salvation. There is but one body and one spirit, one Lord, one faith. As members of the body of Christ, all believers are animated by the same spirit and the same hope. Divisions in the church dishonor the religion of Christ before the world and give occasion to the enemies of truth to justify their course. Paul's instructions were not written alone for the church in his day. God designed that they should be sent down to us. What are we doing to preserve unity in the bonds of peace? When the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the early church, the brethren loved one another. They did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, 
such as should be saved. Those primitive Christians were few in numbers, without wealth or honor, yet they exerted a mighty influence. The light of the world shone out from them. They were a terror to evildoers wherever their character and their doctrines were known. For this cause, they were hated by the wicked and persecuted even unto death. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 239. Paul carried with him the atmosphere of heaven. All who associated with him felt the influence of his union with Christ. The fact that his own life exemplified the truth he proclaimed gave convincing power to his preaching. Here lies the power of truth. The unstudied, unconscious influence of a holy life is the most convincing sermon that can be given in favor of Christianity. Argument, even when unanswerable, may provoke only opposition. But a godly example has a power that it is impossible wholly to resist. The Acts of the Apostles, page 510. For further reading, that I may know him, he is coming again, page 348, and, reflecting Christ, glorify God in our body and spirit, page 138.